good evening. Good evening. You guys don't sound very enthusiastic. Good evening. Good evening. Do we have anybody online? Not now? Okay. Not yet. Who do I have that's going to volunteer to pray us in? Joey. I need help. I was actually going to get Charlie, so you got off. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you can stick your tongue out if you want to. Now you're going to close us out. <laughs> okay. Okay. Lord, thank you for this wonderful day. Thank you for everyone that's here online. Um, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. So who did their homework? Anybody? You had to pray for something. <laughs> someone something a circumstance situation does anybody have any testimonies that they'd like to share about their prayer okay donita so you might need to help me um i don't know if i can get through this you, uh, can. you can do all things through christ he gives you the strength. So my son, um, he has a drinking problem, hence why I have the grandkids. Um, and when he drinks, he um, talks about committing suicide and okay. has attempted cutting himself. Mm -hmm. um, so we've been praying about that. Um, and when he got this job at Vermeer, they put him with, a man that's training him that was an alcoholic and did commit, try to commit suicide. And he shot himself in the, and one side of his face is messed up. And, um, and I think he's been talking to Mitchell about it because the night that they went out, everybody got a drink but him. So, right? Am I correct? Do you remember what last week's title was? No. <laughs> <laughs> why is Not prayer often, essential? Often. Yes, yes, yes. So why is that prayer essential that you pray? Because I, I feel because he's not praying for himself right now mm -hmm. that he's got people praying for him and God's Okay, so how do you vet the voices that tell you that when the enemy comes in like a flood, the word of God lifts up a standard? How do you lift up the standard against those voices that say your son's going to harm himself, that he's an alcoholic and he's not going to get any better? How do you vet those voices? Um, well, if I'm being honest with you, at first when they come, I, I don't vent them. Mm -hmm. um, and it starts to take me mm -hmm. to a place that I don't want to go. Um, and when I start going there, I just, um, talk to God and ask him not to let those thoughts come into my head because I don't know how I would handle if he did do that. If but it, you are vetting it. You're not even realizing that that's what you're doing. You're vetting it because you talk to God and say, don't allow this to come in. That is separating that voice from what you have been hearing. So you're already doing it. See, a lot of times we get to the point to where we think so technically. God doesn't need all that. All he needs for you to do is have a conversation just like you and I are having right now. And you're already vetting the voices. Stop thinking so technically and analytically into these things because you're already doing it. God is giving you the strength. You said you get down and and he raises up that standard right during that time where you're feeling down and says, no, my child, that's not how we're going to do this. What we're going to do is we're going to pray about this. We're going to lift him up in prayer. And when you did that, he got to a position that not only did he gain a job, but he gained somebody that has experience with what he's already gone through. And they can help him through it. Now, we don't maybe not know the status of Mitchell. Is that what his name was? We may not know the status of him, but if God can use a donkey, why can't he use Mitchell? I don't know if he's a believer or not. He very well could be. But because of your prayers, the fervent 
effectual prayers of the righteous availeth much. So that means when you're praying, God's working. So remember that you're already vetting those voices. When it comes in, you're like, no, no, I can't even think about that. God, I need you to take care of this. You're vetting them. See how simple the vetting is? We yeah, make it saying, seem so difficult. I was thinking that we had to vent them as far as them not coming at all. Oh, no, honey. That's how I was always taking going to come. Venting. Satan still comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He's always going to come in. He comes in as a roaring lion, but he ain't got no teeth. He comes in like a roaring lion, but the word of God lifts up the standard and pushes him back. That's why the Bible says to submit yourself unto God, resist the devil. And guess what? He's got to flee. He has to flee. We make things more difficult than what they actually have to be. Okay. Once you get to the point to where you understand this, it'll become more simplistic because your relationship grows with God. And you'll be able to come to him like, look, I, I, I can't do this one right here. I'm going to need you to take this because this, this is above my pay grade, God. Sorry, I can't do this right now. Until that standard is lifted up. Something that you said that was really important, especially being that there's so many newbies here. Um, we think that we're supposed to bet them to where they don't come at all. If that is the case, then why does the Bible say the weapon will be formed, but it shall not prosper? So that lets you know that we, there's always going to be something that we have to fight. And the Bible tells us that all things, not some things, but everything works together for our good. So even when these tough things are coming our way, there is something that God is using that for to help us to grow beyond where we are, to push to the next level, to prepare us for what is to come. And it's not about blessings. We think that it's about blessings. Blessings is just a after effect or, or something that comes as a result of your obedience. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that our, our blessing really is in our standing. Amen. It really is. It's in our standing. So you're vetting the voice, standing on the word of God and continuing to fight against those voices that are trying to tell you something different. This will always be this way. No, my Bible says, no, it is written. That is how Jesus fought. And that's how we have to fight. Mm -hmm. And we've seen it a million times in Luke four, where it says after all the temptations had gone through that the devil left him for a more opportune time. So that means that the devil came back around again. It didn't stop. So if that was how it was with Jesus, why do we think that we're not always going to have some type of a battle? We're either always going into a battle, going through a battle, or just coming out of a battle. But any way it is, wherever you are in the process, always rejoice through it all. Rejoice through it all because it's working for your good. It's strengthening you. It's preparing you and it's going to bless you. I promise you. Amen. And just a reminder from last week, the things that prayer helps with, does anybody remember any of them? Anybody online remember any of the things that prayer helps with? Bring you closer to God. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. Okay, so it helps us to grow closer to God. That was the first one. Matt was right. Um, it looks like prayer helps us to align ourselves with God's will. Yes, it does. Shows you that your life is not about you. Do you remember that? Gives you strength and hope. Charlie was absolutely right. Wisdom and guidance. Mm-hmm. What else is there? How about increases your faith? Yes. Peace and comfort. God, forgiveness and resistance. Of temptation, temptation. right. Give thanks, praise. Ah, isn't that what Apostle just said? Give thanks and praise. 
while you're going through. Amen. So how do we learn from the Lord's Prayer? Mm -hmm. How are you building that relationship? Mm -hmm. Remember last week we talked about going from faith to faith, faith to faith. So, Shelby, did you have something? I was just going to say, so even if we don't like finish our prayers, does it still count? What do you mean by finish our prayers? Like sometimes I'll like go to bed before I pray or before I go to sleep, I'll pray and I won't finish my prayer or I'll like go to sleep because I'm tired. So like, I guess I feel like he still listens, but does it still count? <laughs> <laughs> that is a good question. <laughs> what do you believe? What? <laughs> A lot of times, I'm sure all of us have been guilty of that. We start off praying and get in the groove of it. And the next thing you know, you wake up at four o'clock in the morning. You're like, wait a minute, what, what just happened? <laughs> I think all of us do that. I think um, so. The thing that comes to mind with me with that is even when you don't know how to pray, God listens to your yearnings and your groanings. So. I think, have you ever been like falling asleep and you know that you're falling asleep, but you can't quite stop yourself from falling asleep and things are running through your mind? Our subconscious mind never stops. It never stops. So I believe that that's a part of the moanings and groanings that he hears from. Now, I would say get in the habit of not lying down when you go to pray because it's so easy to fall asleep. So easy. You won't even know that you're sleepy half the time. So, and I've even, I shouldn't even say this. I've even fallen asleep on my knees. So, <laughs> but I'd be so tired and I didn't even realize it. I'd be praying and you know, you get to moaning and groaning and yes, Lord, yes, Lord. And the next thing I'm like, oh Lord, <laughs> what just happened? I've done that. So what I used to do, and it used to drive my kids up a wall. I would get up three, four, five o'clock in the morning, and I would go in and pray, and I'd be speaking in tongues, and they would like this, like, oh, my God, I wish he'd shut up. But that's how I kept myself awake. So I would make certain that I was alert when I would begin to pray, because if I did not, honey, I'd fall asleep on you in a drop of a dime. Uh, my, my, uh, excuse me, it's, uh, everyone, please, everyone, please use the mic because other people listen to our Bible studies that aren't living here, and they said they're missing vital parts of the Bible studies they listen to because, excuse me, we won't use the microphone. So please use the microphone. I think uh, another thing that helps when it comes to being tired when you're wanting to pray because you hear the Lord telling you like now's the time and um avoid worship music. I I go I go straight to praise. If you go straight to praise, a lot of people think that your prayers are so much deeper in, in worship because worship like takes you to a another level of intimacy and in God and everything, which is so true. But we shouldn't count out praise. Mm -hmm. Praise also drives things. It also pushes things and shifts the mindset of you. Whereas sometimes worship, if you're not listening to the right worship music and the ones that are giving you the right, um, you know, uh, encouraging word, you're definitely going to fall asleep. And so turning on that praise, you know, and it, and you start just driving in the spirit and just, you know, standing up straight and just lifting your hands and just dancing before the Lord. Like it doesn't have to be something crazy, but just prophetic worship, prophetic dancing before the Lord. It starts to really wake you up and get you prepared um, to to start speaking things unto him, to worship him, lift him up high, exhort him, you know, and so. Those are those are other ways that you can actually wake up for a second. After you're done with that, turn something, turn some uh, worship music, then lay down. 
<laughs> and then as you're as you're worshiping and you're done praying and everything like that, and you're still just in his presence, you can finally go to sleep and and actually be wrapped up in that. You know, it's a it's a beautiful thing. So shower ministry like a lot of us do or the throne room ministry where we're praying while we're taking a shower and sometimes the water gets cold because you've been in there because you god starts popping different things to you like man i've been in here oh i'm almost late for work okay but i've had that time alone with god and I mean, what better place that that's how you get to intimacy with God, that time alone, spending it with him, talking to him and not only talking, the other part is listening. That is crucial. You have to listen. And what are some of the ways that you listen? Before you shift to that, can I share this about the sleepiness? Part of the sleepiness is to get you not to pray. The enemy begins to press upon you and make you tired so that you don't pray. Why? Because your um, releasing of sound, your release of prayers, your release of decrees, declarations, binding, loosing is against him. So if he can make you so tired through oppression. So remember that you were there for the uh, sermon that I preached um, at King of Kings which I probably need to preach here. I'm not going to do it this weekend, but maybe the following weekend or the following Sunday, because I got to wrap up um, from part of the apostle. And then maybe I'll preach that sermon here next weekend, because we got to get that understanding regarding oppression. The purpose of oppression is to press down upon you to make you heavy, to make you tired, to make you sleepy so that you don't become the force against the enemy or a force. And you've got to know that or else he wouldn't fight you the way that he does. You are a force to be reckoned with. So stand up, do what you need to do and worship that praise is going to drive him out so that you can be free to do whatever it is that you need to do. When you shift your mind on him, I don't care what's going on around you. There was a situation where my nephew had um, a issue with uh, witchcraft and he had attacked my dad and my dad went to the hospital in an ambulance. My nephew disappeared with a knife in his hand. And next minute, you know, we get a phone call that he has taken the knife, plunged it into his neck and he's at another hospital. So I've got my sister and a couple of people at one hospital with my dad who, when they released him, I'm taking him home. He said, take me back. I feel like I'm having a heart attack. I whipped that car around on two wheels, got him back to Mercy Hospital. They took him back in and kept him. So I've got sisters over here. And then me and his sister and my sister, Deb, are headed to the other hospital. But before I went to that other hospital, I stopped at my house. And he happened to have his speakers downstairs and I turned up that worship music and I just went in. Now, anybody else would have been like, I got to get to the hospital. I got to get to the hospital. I got, I need the presence of God right now because I don't know what I'm going into. And I'm going into a place where my nephew has been overtaken. He showed up to my house and said he was the 13th disciple of Christ. So he's completely overtaken by the enemy at this point. That's what thrusts me into deliverance ministry. So the reality is the enemy wants to keep you from stopping and praying, listening for strategy, implementing that strategy and defeating him. Trust what God is doing when he's telling you stop and pray. When he's telling you, listen to what I'm saying, because I'm trying to tell you how to get through this. It's not an easy thing. Melanie said something to me a couple of weeks ago, maybe even last week. It wasn't last week because I wasn't here last week, right? Everything's blending. It really is. Everything's blending right now. It's still a blur. But a couple of weeks ago, she said to me, you're always so calm. How do you do that? And it's honestly a learned thing because chaos is happening, but I have to learn how to quiet my soul Bet the voices that I'm hearing because fear has a voice. We've learned that, right? Bet the voices and figure out which one is God. Slow down. Listen. 
and everything was going on around me and it was chaotic and everything was happening, but I was able to stay right there in that moment that I was in. And she noticed it and spoke about it. So you got to learn how to slow it down. Listen. And don't react. Respond in the realm of the spirit. Amen. Everybody online, um, do the homework and have something to share with us. You guys are awfully quiet. Anybody there? This is Deb, and I did not do the homework. I apologize. Okay. Well, you still got time. <laughs> yes, I do. I could do it right now, huh? You sure can. <laughs> and then you can come back and share. <laughs> that is fair. That is fair. Anybody else? Or just have a testimony that you would like to share of the goodness of God, something that he's done for you even if it wasn't in the homework. Well, I didn't do the homework and I'm in need of prayer. Okay. So pray for me because I got all kinds of chosen things going through me. Mm -hmm. I, have, um, I have an art show coming up next week and okay. I have art, pictures, paintings of my former pastor's daughter. And okay. I wanted, I wanted to send them to him. I wanted to do two of the exact same painting mm -hmm. with a little um card that said um in honor of the pastor's family. And I'm fighting whether I should do it or not. I don't want any money for it. Well, stay don't in want... prayer. God will give you the answer as to whether or not you would need to do it. Okay. Anybody else have anything that they need to add? Um, can you grab that mic? Oh, you got one there. Go ahead. Um, it kind of has something to do with her testimony. Okay. Um, I don't know. She told me that it's because like I'm still learning, but I kind of am a little ashamed that I didn't see what was going on in front of me with my brother. Like, the signs and wonders that God does. Like, I'm ashamed that I didn't see that that's what happened with my brother. Why are you ashamed that you didn't see it? Because I feel like I should know. I don't know. Why? God, I don't know. I feel like I should know God already. Mm, you should know God. That is absolutely true. But do you think that this child came from me? <laughs> I pushed him out. Do you think I know everything that goes on with him? He's mine. I don't know everything that goes on with him. There are some things that God will reveal to me and I can take it to him. There are some things that his shepherd, well, apostle, because he's an apostle too, reveals. God reveals to her and she'll take it to him. Everything is not for us. Everybody has an assignment. And that your brother may not have been your assignment. And you know why? Because maybe you were too close to the situation and you might have hindered more than you helped. Meaning that because you guys are so close, you're going to go in and try to take over everything and bring him through this because God is on my side and I can do this. He's got to be able to walk on his own. And because you're so close to him, he shielded you from being able to see it because you was gonna run over there like Superman, Mighty Mouse, that's what we'll call you. You was gonna run over there like Mighty Mouse and save the day. That's not your job. Your job is to pray him through, pray him through it. Everything that goes on with my children, I don't always know. The, again, there are some things that God will reveal and because of the relationship that I have with my children, they know that they can't always come and tell me when somebody's did something wrong to them. They want me to stay saved. Yeah. So they don't do that. They'll come after the fact and tell me most of the time. But they know that in the midst of it, don't come tell me that because I'm on my way. God's still working with me on that. So he knows she'll that from her. She don't need that right now. She hasn't developed to what I need her to be. So it's not your job always. That's not your assignment. 
Stay in the lane that God have you driving in because when you go into another lane, you're going to cause a crash. So, Mike. Mike. I would, I would also say to you, being a brother who has witnessed things like that with my siblings and feeling the same way that you felt, um, give yourself grace and also forgive yourself. Like it, it don't don't allow that um that guilt to uh take you over because like there's like she's saying you know it's not in your control mm -hmm. everything is in god's timing it's not in your timing um like she's saying there's certain things that you're just not going to be able to know there are certain things that he might say hey shelby wake up something's happening with your brother mm -hmm. and then he might show you in part what is happening and then you pray for that thing but everything else in between that's none of your concern i mean yes you're supposed to you know pray and war on behalf of your sibling or any of your family members but whatever mistakes they make is mistakes that they make mm -hmm. it's not something that you know you have to beat yourself over uh, over constantly even as a mother that's not something that you have to beat yourself up over constantly. I used to hold my mother to a lot of the mistakes that I made. Now, you have to realize that there are things that happen in your life or whatever, or inside your siblings' lives or whatever, that, you know, were not put on them or whatever the case may be. But once you are grown, uh -huh. once you can make the decision to actually know right from wrong, it is no longer on the sibling and no longer on the parent. It is now on the person, on the individual who decided to commit the sin, who decided to keep on perpetuating the sin. So again, forgive yourself of it. Release all that stuff off of you Amen. so that way you can have more freedom to develop more in Christ. So when the time comes and another person who is not your sibling is going through the same situation, the Lord can wake you up in the middle of the night and say, reach out. So that's all I ask. Amen. Yeah, and don't allow the enemy to condemn you. There is no condemnation, none. Don't be condemned by the fact that you didn't realize. Again, that's not your job. It's not. So many times we become busybodies and don't realize it. Amen. Or also, Mike. We're also here for each other to point out God's works mm -hmm. also. And when she started to tell me that about the guy that was with Mitchell, it just hit me like, Shelby, do you see? But you're also a mother. So a mother's watching. <laughs> well, I, well, that's why I'm saying, that's what I'm telling her. Like, do you, I said, I'm like, do you see what God just did? You know? And she's like, Oh no, I didn't. I said, that's okay though. Like I, it just came to me like when she was just telling me, but that's what I feel like we're here to point out those things that God Amen. does. Cause there's times that I don't see it and she'll point it out to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. <clears throat> Ms. Barr. Okay. This week, uh, all last week, I got to keep doing it. I've got one. Got oh, okay. Um, I haven't, really seen any results or anything i've been praying for charlie's daughter because she doesn't like me totally she anyway she's going through some medical problems right now and she won't even tell us you know how she's doing or what she's blocked the whole family off facebook and everything we we can't find out anything. Mm -hmm. So I just been praying for, her, you know, soften her heart, God, you know, do something, you know, because she shouldn't be going through this alone, but she won't let any of us in. Mm -hmm. So God does things according to his time. And you, since you are not in, you don't know what God's doing for her. No, you don't know at this point in time. It could be one day that she ends up on your doorstep. You don't know how God's going to do it. 
And I think that we have the expectation that God is going to turn things around instantaneously. And that is not always the case because that person's heart needs to be worked on, just like you said. And sometimes because we have free will, the heart is hard and he's got to go in and break down that stony heart and make it a heart of flesh so that he can penetrate it. <laughs> as far as um, th this thing about the painting, I've been going over this, over this. My family says, don't uh, send them any painting pictures. Don't um, uh, contact him. M but my heart keeps going off. I don't want to contact him. His father is a love of him. Can't do that. Mother, I think that at this point in time, what I'm hearing from you is you need to spend some time praying and fasting and asking God what direction you need to take. Because a lot of times we will take the direction that our head thinks that we should take. And it may not be in the will of God. So these kind come out only by fasting and praying. So maybe it's you can fast many different ways. There are different types of fasts. It's not always food. Maybe it's that you are thinking too much for yourself. There's a fast from that. I will never, ever forget the time that <laughs> somebody put me on a seven day fast. I did not realize that I was like, every time I would say something, I'd be like, but that's so hard. And she was like, what do you say all the time? I was like, I don't know, I got all kinds of sayings. What are you talking about? She said, every time you talk, you say this one word. I couldn't figure it out for the life of me. So she had to point it out to me. And for an entire week, I could not say hard. And I had to tell all of my family members and they would keep me accountable for it. Every time I said hard, they'd be like, eh, no, 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 it's not hard. You better figure it out. And for that whole entire week, I was so mad at her. But then I realized how much I was saying that and I had to fast away from that and I had to get away from that mindset as well. So fasting could be anything. It really could be. That was a more difficult fast than me pushing my plate away. It was hard, <laughs> just kidding. But it felt like it was difficult at the time, but I was able to get through it and it made me realize the things that came out of my mouth and how I was bringing hard situations to me by saying just that so mm -hmm. so that's another form of fasting it sounds like at this point in time because you're on the fence about that God is not the author of confusion you wouldn't be confused by something that he directs you to do so if he's directing you to do it get before him and ask him exactly what it is that you're supposed to do if he wants you to share your art then you share your art but here's the thing what if you shared your art with somebody that stole it from you you don't ever know what the person's intent is behind that. And maybe that's why God keeps putting up those roadblocks for you. And you haven't got to share your art because of that. So I, I would suggest that you get before God and fast and pray about it. And he will give you the direction that you need. Amen. Did you have something else, Miss Barb? Oh, Jalo, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, um, one of the things that God is teaching me right now when it comes to situations that you don't see um happening you know instantaneously or like like a quick turnaround um we always pray just one time but we're not bombarding heaven with the prayers and we're not pushing it through mm -hmm. and so one of the things that god is trying to work with me on because we just dealt with this over in washington i had a vacation but i also had a spiritual like beat down <laughs> and so one of the things that God is trying to get me to do more of is push things in the spirit, push things through prayer mm -hmm. and not just pray one time and be like, okay, God, <clears throat> I'm waiting. I'm waiting, you know, and it, it's not enough anymore. It, it's really never been enough, but he has grace and he, yeah. he, he wants us to grow all the time. And so one thing I will say to you, concerning you know charlie's daughter is and your daughter honestly is you know push that in prayer keep mm -hmm. pushing keep pushing keep pushing keep pushing and and when we're talking about seeds of doubt and things like that rebuke that thing mm -hmm. that is not something that needs to be dwelling for too long it shouldn't it's going to come of course because the weapon will form but it shall not prosper rebuke all the doubt, rebuke all the frustration, rebuke all the worry, 
all the anxiety, mm -hmm. whatever it is that tries to come up against you, rebuke that thing and then push it through prayer. And then when you see, you know, a glimpse of, you know, um, an open door, keep pushing. We don't stop until what apostle says, mission complete. Amen. And she fully comes back into the family and she then comes into the church and she then begins to to walk in the things of God. Amen. Mission complete. That's Amen. Good. That's good. And also realize that God is not a genie or a Buddha. We don't get to rub his belly or his head and he does exactly what we say that we need. He's not an ATM where you can just stick your card in there and then the cash comes out. He, he's not any of those things. You got to have a relationship with him. It's just like when you first met Charlie, could you go to him and ask him for anything when you first met him? Now, he's the type of person that that might have been possible. I'm not sure. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, so you got to well, build that relationship. Yeah. You, well, and I'm sure that Terry and George did this with you all while you were in Mexico. Think about how when you got to that last day and it was just Campo de Fe and how you all had seen so many signs, so many miracles, so many wonders. The presence of God was so thick. You guys are laying hands on people and they're falling out in the spirit. But you get to Campo de Fe because you know that there's a praying woman there, but you stop. And what happened? Everybody came back with a heaviness. Everybody, the whole team came back with a heaviness and some were saying what? I don't ever want to go back there again. Mm. And it's because we did not push all the way through in prayer. Usually, and even Terry, if she's on here, she I is. think she can speak to it, but she said that she struggled even being in there. So that meant that they were under some oppression. Remember, we're talking about oppression. They're being oppressed to try to shut them down. We don't know who is on that mountain with them? We have no clue who is in those houses around that mountain. All we know is that they're at the top of the mountain and that they are, there was, there's a lot of heaviness. So going up that mountain, I would usually pray and y'all didn't even know I was doing it, yeah. but we would press all the way through all the way till we got back and we had our last service. And then we press as we go through the airport. So even in this, it's not just when you go abroad, you have to carry that same principle here while you're in the States, while you're dealing with things in your home, while you're feeding the homeless, while you're um, dealing with things with your health, whatever it is, press all the way through. Amen. Do not stop until you hear mission complete. Amen. Don't stop until you hear it. Amen. Amen. Keep pushing. You're a force. Be a force. Amen. Amen. And press through in love. See how I did that segue? See how that went? All right. <laughs> so love. What type of love does God require us to display? Anybody have any ideas? Light into darkness. Are there different types of love? Yes. Okay. Uh, we don't we don't have a mic there, There's sir. A mic over there. Mm -hmm. Okay, what'd you say? Oh, different types of love. All I said was there was agape love, but I there's more. But I what is agape love? <laughs> <laughs> he said, "I don't know." He's heard of it. It's okay. <laughs> it's all right. The love of God. Okay. Okay. We'll see. Isn't agape unconditional love? Well, go ahead. Somebody that didn't do their homework came back and redeemed. Look at you, girl. <laughs> I love it. All right. Can you go to the next <laughs> slide, please? What do you think's coming next? <laughs> you think so? Let's see. What's up there? Can we go to the next slide? <gasps> Biblical love. Let's see. What did you have? Agape. Okay. Eros. 
Look at the little romantic love over here. Isn't that cute? I hope not. <laughs> so these are the four types of biblical love. I'm sure that there's probably more, but these are the four that I went through and studied. Now, don't ask me how to pronounce the first two. I think it's storage. Did you really? <laughs> okay, so phileo. Is eros, agape, and phileo. I, I'm okay. Okay. Pretty good. Can we go to the next slide? Did you know about these? How do I get the video? I can't get the video to come up. Slide it over, mommy. Slide your phone over. Slide it over. Slide to the left. Crisscross. Are y'all ready? July 19th, you're going to do it. And it better not show up on Facebook. <laughs> okay. Ludus, I believe is how it's pronounced. The playful and flirtatious love. Fragma. Committed, long-lasting love. And what's that last one? Falousha. That sounds kind of weird. Self-love. That kind of sounds like Palacio. Oh, it's so weird. <laughs> Unline, did any of you know these different types of love? No? That's okay. We're here to learn together. Agape. Okay. Next slide. This one. This one's gonna go pretty fast. I'm pretty sure. But how do we show variations of love? Anybody? Hug. Hug. Okay. And especially when you have people that come against what your beliefs are, how do you show those variations of love? It's hard. Um, we need a mic up to you, sweetie. This one's good because this one's hard. hard for me to. Why is it hard? Well, because like I've had my brother challenge me a couple times of biblical and stuff, and I've tried to tell him what I've learned, and I don't know how to show love, like love through that. Huh, I wonder why God didn't assign you to him. <laughs> you haven't gotten there yet, but you're going to get there and you're going to be able. The Bible says with love and kindness, have I drawn thee? Yep. So if you don't have that love and kindness, you're not going to draw him, but away the other direction. So because we have to have that love. We have to be able to display it even when you're on the road and somebody cuts you off and you want to flip a bird. But you got to flip a Jesus, please help me. Even when somebody comes and tells you that um, you're homophobic because you won't accept my life, but you want me to accept yours. How do you show love then? How do you show love when the atheist comes and tells you, you ain't got no God? That, that, that. You got to hate the sin, not the person. Mm -hmm. Is that easy, though? No. No? Why isn't it easy? Uh, I mean, because we're human. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, so here, it's hard to accept stuff. Yep, that's the key to it. But here, there are two different forms that you're going against. This is going to be the easiest way for me to explain it. You got the flesh and you got the spirit. Whichever one you feed elevates. That's the one that wins. So your flesh says, how dare you challenge me who you think you are? So that means that carnally we're minded. Then your spirit says, got to show the love of God in everything that I do. That's where you're spiritually minded. So whatever you feed the most is the one that's going to elevate. Remember that a lot of times our first instinct is to respond in the natural. Unless, even sometimes, even when you have had time with God, if that one thing happens that triggers that memory, that gives a flashback of something that happened to you in your past, and maybe you're not quite delivered from it, 
that flesh can rise before the spirit does. And then God has to send a check to you. Like apostle says, punch you in your throat and make you realize I, 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 that's not how I respond. That's your flesh. Go ahead. Shelby. Not confused, but how like you, you put your mind on pause and like stop and think like, how would you show that love? Like walk away uh, if you need to. I guess I guess it all varies on the person, right? This or is where scripture becomes very important, very very important. The Bible says, "Thy word have I hid in thine heart that I might not sin against thee." So if the word of God is hidden in your heart, then when that flesh begins to rise, the Holy Spirit should be able to give you an unction and say, "No, nope, that's not right. That's not right." But Understand, you can override the Holy Spirit. Say, you can do that? that. Oh, it does. But it's depending on what you're concentrating on. Again, whatever you are feeding the most is the one that elevates the most. So if you're not spending time learning your word, reading your word, spending time with God, memorizing your word, if you're not doing these things, guess what? The familiar thing is what's going to rise, and that's the flesh. That's what's going to rise. So it's important to learn the word of God. So there'll be times that people do something to me. I'd be like, okay, God, greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. You know, I want to punch him, but you know, you said that I'm an overcomer. I'm more than a conqueror. You said these things so help me to conquer this because I want to conquer them. So, I mean, it takes having that word hid in your heart. Go ahead. Um, so we were in Washington, right? It was the last day. And at night. And so if anybody knows me, if anybody knows me, like before Jesus Christ, you say one smart thing to me, it's on a popping. I'm just I was just like my mom when she was younger. Like we, we like to fight. <laughs> and um really? so Seriously. this man's walking down the street. My my apostle at the time my nano because when we do a ministry things that's my apostle but in vacation that's my grandma that's my nana so she we're at the the um navy site pier. the navy pier and she's crying i'm making sure she's okay turning around i see this guy coming and so i turn back around make sure she's okay again and i just go off and looking in, into the sky and just talking to god i look back down he's walking towards me we make eye contact i just nor I just looked just looked at him that was all that was it I never said anything to him and he just started saying some things that were just not appropriate at all and immediately usually what would happen is I would engage in conversation or ball up my fist and just be ready to go but immediately I just was like I felt a peace and I was just like okay I'm gonna stay calm I'm not going to react I'm not even going to say anything I didn't say a word to him. All of a sudden, of course, you hear your apostle come behind me and she starts speaking in tongues all extra hard. <laughs> and she, and because listen, because listen, this is another thing. You have to be, you also have to be um, uh, knowledgeable enough to have people around you who will fight with you instead of against you. That's a word. And so she literally came up behind me because he's coming back. Mm -hmm. He's walking away. And I'm thinking that it's over. He turns around, he walk, he turns back around, and he's about to come back towards me. You can tell he's underneath um some principal uh, uh demonic, demonic influence or mm -hmm. oppression. And so in, yes. And immediately, as soon as she starts speaking in tongues, he begin to walk the other direction and walk away. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing that is important to note in this moment that I, I actually asked the Lord about, you know. Why did it take for her to come in and actually have to do that? Yes, because she's been in the faith for so long and she's had this practice. But also, I did not take the time when I felt the peace to actually pray that he receive it as well. Mm -hmm. I didn't take the time to do that. I was just like, okay, well, I feel at peace. I'm going to hold into it. And I'm going to pray that the Lord just keep on bringing me through this so I don't go and do things I'm not supposed to do in Washington, D.C. And so when you get into moments like that and you feel God give you that peace, also pray for that individual that's going through and antagonizing you or whatever the case may be. Pray for them. 
because yes, it's great that she was there. And I'm really happy that, you know, you have somebody around you that can actually, you know, fight with you and not against you, but you also have to do some work too. Amen. So, yeah. Amen. And that's another way of showing, showing, um, to know that the love of God is, is so real, you know, because in that moment, I could have reacted. I could have went back to the old man instead of becoming who God has called me to be, you know, and, and to show the love of Christ. And yeah, it was, it was different. Amen. It was something because in that moment, I literally had to pray a hedge of protection for him and for me but to also pray to restrain his flesh. And you can't stop and think of words. Because if I'd had to think through that and just, Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I need you to restrain his flesh and then go through all of the prayers to do that. And then, and, and in the meantime, he's coming back. Dude's turning around and he's coming back. So immediately you, you have to go into a heavenly language and believe the word because Holy Spirit is doing what? Interceding on our behalf. Jesus is doing what? Interceding on our behalf. So if Jesus is in heaven interceding on our behalf, Holy Spirit's in the earth translating what I'm saying. I have to stand on that and trust that God's going to work it out. It's 1130 at night. It's dark. We don't know where we're at. We're waiting on a dang on Uber. The people that we were there are already gone. You know, that we knew they're already gone. And notice when the attack hit, we're at the Navy Memorial. My father was in the Navy. So I'm looking at this. What am I thinking about? So I'm having this vulnerable moment in the governmental district of Washington, D.C. Now, what he doesn't, I don't even know if you knew this or not. But the building that we were standing in front of, so that, remember the big building right there? So the Navy Memorial's here. There's a big building here. I had did warfare on behalf of our bloodline earlier that day in that building. Standing in the same building that the Emancipation Proclamation is in. So the Lord had me to cleanse our bloodline from some things. And so part of that, was backlash. So I'm having a moment because I'm thinking my daddy was in the Navy and I'm crying and all of the things that he did while he was in the Navy and I'm rejoicing, but crying. And so it was a vulnerable moment. And here that man is walking past and you can hear him talking to himself, but you know, people, it looked like they're talking to themselves all the time because why they have earbuds and you can't see their earbuds, right? So he could have just been talking to somebody on the phone, but the conversation was really random. And it was something about, I don't know, something that he said that made me come out of this emotional state that I was in and oh, hold up. That's mine. Nope. And yeah, but I went straight for the spirit because I realized what was happening. That was backlash. And you also, you mentioned that you were in a governmental building. What are we supposed to do? Come on. Guide, guide govern, govern and, and guard. guard. What did she do? I rose up. Exactly. And that's, that's, you'll get to that place. So don't beat yourselves up because you're not here. How many years have I been at this? And I'm still learning. Right. There are times where I still find myself not quite making the right decision, um, I had told <laughs> George and Terry <laughs> what she said, <laughs> we're going to cook this food and we're feeding these people. And the next morning I got up and next minute, you know, <laughs> Holy Spirit was like, um, you going to fix that before we get to talk or what, what's going on? <laughs> what you going to do? You think you're just going to slide back in position with this sin hanging over your head? And I was like, oh, so I had to come back. And correct that I called Terry and George and I'm like, I got beat up. I was wrong. And we are not going to break the rules because if we do that, and this is the thing that, that caught me with that, 
We don't realize that our emotional decisions have spiritual consequences. And, and here's what the Lord hit me with. And it, it really messed me up because, you know, he was so gentle about it, but we always talk about being reprobate. When you look at uh, Romans one about being reprobate, this, like the second step, I think it was, if I call it steps, but a portion of being reprobate is teaching others to do wrong when you know that it's wrong. That's one of the steps of, or uh, how do I want to say it? it's not steps. It's a, uh, gosh, phases, a they phase do. or a characteristic. That's one of the characteristics to know that a person is reprobate. They will teach others. They will do the wrong themselves. Know that it's wrong and still do it, but also tell others, Hey, come on and do it. And when he highlighted that for me, I was like, Whoa, father, forgive me. No, I'm not reprobate. I know I'm not reprobate. I'm still chasing after you. He said, but you were heading that direction. You know that it's wrong, but you're choosing to do it. And then, so that's rebellion. And what kicks you over into reprobate is when you start teaching others to do it that way too. So we got to be careful because that opens up the door, not only for you to give the enemy a foothold, but for those that you have just told that this is okay, do it this way. We want to make sure that we're pushing through the right way. Don't beat yourself up, but listen, listen for his voice. Vet what voices are telling you to do. If you know that it's wrong, just don't do it. Just don't do it. And don't make excuses. Rise up to the challenge of fighting that devil and winning. Amen. Amen. Okay. So what are some of the ways and just um, let me just preference this by saying the next slide has misspelling. So Deb, don't come for me because I know you're coming at me. I know you're coming. So, I will not. Yes, you will. <laughs> yes, you will. <laughs> So these are the, some of the ways that we can show God love. First one, tithing. The next one is supposed to be fasting. I'm not sure what that word is, but yeah, something like that. Yeah. Being hopeful, loving those around us. Woo, sometimes that is a challenge. Giving God praise, reading the Bible and prayer. Those are the ways that we can show God love. And while she, uh, Apostle was talking, I thought about something. For the last 14 days, we have been without hot water. Mm. Our hot water went out. I got to the point to where I'm going back and forth with these people that own the townhouses. And I'm going back and forth, going back and forth. Finally, I was like, I'm calling the city. I'm getting the city to come out here. And my husband was like, Vail, stop acting in emotion. And I was like, dang. That hurt. It hurt really bad because I had to sit and think about it. Lord, I am giving an emotional response. Instead of doing putting this forth in prayer, pushing this thing through, it took me 14 days to get that you're responding in emotion. Sometimes it takes a while, but thank God for the grace that he has. I made it to that today. She was so eager to make sure they sent a part that was the wrong part they sent another part she had sent me a a message and I was I had to go in and out today so I was pulling up she was coming down to my house to make sure that this part was there so that they could get it fixed so they were trying but my emotional response was oh you ain't gonna do what you need to do well let me get you not the appropriate response but God still did shield me from doing something I had no business doing I could have rose up in my flesh and had an emotional response had I not listened to my husband. And there was a time we talked about this last week. There was a time I'd be like, bump you. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. I'm going to get this handled. I'm not going to wait for you to do it. And I had to repent of that. And I had to be cognizant of the fact that, okay, my husband said, leave this alone. I'm going to have to leave it alone and I'm going to have to give it to God. In the past, that would not have happened. It would not have. I'm just going to be honest with you. It would not have happened. I would have overrid everything that he said. 
and I would have went and taken care of it myself. But I was like, okay. And I kept, <laughs> when the kids would come through and they'd be like, is there hot water? No, your dad won't let me. <laughs> but I'm glad that he didn't allow me to do something in the flesh and that could have had spiritual consequences. What if I would have acted so ugly that there was a point in time where I had to minister to this person that I was acting ugly with, where would they have seen the love of Christ? Right. Wouldn't have seen it. Okay, so we're going to talk about the spiritual meaning of love now. <laughs> Yeah, okay. <laughs> so the practice of love is actions and attitudes that create an atmosphere of kindness, acceptance, and unity in ourselves and in those around us. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Not only the basis of spiritual life, it is also the basis of civilization. This is the, is this a correct statement? Okay. What about the principle of love? The spiritual principle of love calls on us to be gentle, to be kind, and to treat others and ourselves with respect. It is a reminder to choose to live lovingly in our words, which acts of words. So what is the greatest commandment? Hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Yep. Yeah. So, hold on. I can still love my husband and kids, but I don't show it sometimes when I'm angry. So, how do I? The Bible tells us to be angry and sin not. He never said you couldn't be angry, right. but it's what you display through that anger. Like my words. Mm -hmm. words, words have power. Actions. They have power. When you send a word out into the atmosphere, you send it out with an assignment. If I say, I hope you fall down and break your leg, no. that's an assignment. No, if I, I say... I pray that you have a prosperous day and God shows you nothing but joy. That's an assignment. Our words have power. No, I just get loud. Like, <laughs> you know, I just, I don't know. Like when I'm heated, I don't know how to. Talk. Well, Jesus came into the temple and knocked over the tables. Yeah. Get braided the whip. Come get you some of this. Mm-hmm. Well, I I, I, I'm going to need a mic. But yeah. that was righteous anger. What is righteous anger? And, uh, when you get angry and it's, I mean, you're in the right. Okay. Anybody else? What is righteous anger? <laughs> you know it's going to come back to you, so grab the mic. <laughs> Anybody online? What is righteous anger? It's in the word. I don't know the technical term, but I would agree with Shelby's fiance, which I don't know his name. It, Matt. It's Matt. It is when you're um you're angry and have a right to be angry. I I don't know how to put that any other way. I think defending the word. Yeah, defending the word of God. Amen. Defending what the Bible says, what God has says. Okay, Elder Rhonda. Is it something that would make God angry? So you you're think? you're really close. And and that's really what it is. Um it, it's known in the Bible as righteous indignation. And so a righteous anger is what Jesus displayed when he was driving the money changers out with the whip. But why was he driving the mon money changers out with a whip? They the house uh, for because praise. Because they were right. defiling the house. They were defiling the, the temple of God. He said, mm -hmm. my dad's house is supposed to be a house of prayer and you have turned it into a den of thieves. So righteous anger, 
rose up in him, a righteous indignation rose up in him and began to drive out the things that were not like God. So when we're talking righteous anger, it's not just, I have a right to be angry. It is, these things are coming against the advancement of the kingdom. These things are defiling the temple of God. So if there's something on the inside of you that is defiling your temple, you have a right to be angry about it and drive it out. Do we ever think about that? We always think about the church as a building, but we are the temple now. That's Our right. house is Amen. the temple. Amen. Amen. So Amen. if that is the case, then we need to be looking at things within our body, within our mind, also within our own homes, what things are going on in there and drive those things out because they actually have an effect on us. They have an effect on how close we can get to God. They have an effect on how much prayer we can um, get through or, or complete, how often we study our word, how we're able to apply the word, how we're able to declare to decree. Those things actually come in the way. Why? Because a little leaven, leaven it the whole lump. Leaven it the whole lump. It's the little foxes that do destroy what? The vine. Destroy, the vine. destroy the vine. So that is what righteous indignation is about. Yeah. Is making sure that we are keeping the temple of God clean, which is our bodies, as well as our homes. And then after you've conquered those areas, the Bible actually talks about any man who desires to be an elder, a bishop, a, you know, as the list goes on, right? If you desire to be those things, you first need to be in control of yourself, have control over your household, and then you can be over the house of God. Amen. So we've got to not skip steps. People want to jump into a pulpit, but have no control over themselves. That's how you see um, leaders getting into situations where they are sleeping with little kids and having uh, extramarital affairs and all kinds of stuff, stealing the money. There's no self-control. The first thing in the leadership class that I teach is about dealing with you, getting that soul under control. The first year it focuses on nothing, but you getting yourself under control. Because if I unleash you, I am signing off that you are okay to be standing in a pulpit and that you are prepared for um, human consumption, basically. You think about it from the perspective of uh, EMTs and, and fire department and police. They go through a long training to make sure that they are able to be in the public and will handle the public properly. Some of them do, some of them don't, right? But they go through a whole lot of things just to make sure that at least they've done the vetting before they loose them on the people. And some people get missed, they can hide it, right? But for the most part, those who are training them have literally tried their best to prepare them. And that's the responsibility of the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher. To prepare the people for what? The work of the ministry. So that righteous indignation has to go towards the things of God. Again, the three G's, guard, govern, guide. guide. Yeah. Amen? Amen. How did you display that righteous anger? Did you go and start beating everybody with a whip? Okay. Did you cuss everybody out? That so if you cussed God. everybody yes. out, then that means that you sin. And I asked for forgiveness for that part of it. You know, I used to be, I used to have the same issue. And my kids can attest to it. I'd yell. You know how many strikes I went on when they were younger? I stopped cooking, cleaning, everything. I was not playing. I meant that thing. I'd come home, eat a bowl of cereal, and go to bed. But God had to deal with my temperament. And you can ask them, they say something, something to me and I'd go right off the handle. Now I take 10 to win. I'll say Jesus 10 times before I'll respond. I might not say it out loud, but I'm saying it in my head. I'll say it 10 times before I respond to them. And now I'm responding in a different tone, a different manner. I don't have to. Now, are there days that like I can't stand when 
you're in the dining room and the kitchen is right around the corner and you don't take a dish and put it in the sink at least for me to wash, that bothers me. I didn't used to talk like this. Not at all. I'm like, didn't I tell you? But what did that? I'm sorry, sweetie. <laughs> <laughs> I used to respond in that manner, but I can tell you now that they'll receive what I'm saying to them now more when I'm talking to them like this. You're not fighting. <laughs> <laughs> See? See how hostile that was? Had everybody jumping and coming. What do you think they feel when you're doing that? Scared. Mm -hmm. But I do say it nicely at first. Micah. But but here's the thing. I, I do say the things nicely. I come at them nicely. But then after the 10th time, I'm. But you know what? I After the 10th time, then maybe you do it yourself. And then when they come and ask for something, say, remember do when I me do it. <laughs> no, but when they come and ask for something, oh, remember that chore I did for you that I told you to do? Yeah, I don't think you're gonna be able to watch that movie. Next time do your chore and then we can see if that movie's gonna come. Yeah, I can take that away. If it's something like it's their responsibility to do the kitchen. When they come in and say I'm starving. I can't cook until them, the dishes are done. And you have chosen not to do the dishes. So guess everybody's hungry until you do the dishes. Mm -hmm. But you have to help them be aware of their consequences because in the world, there are consequences to every choice we make. Absolutely. And I used to feel, and, and they can be good or bad. I used to feel so bad for Jasmine, you guys. Because O.C. and Kamika would tell her, make a choice. And I'm like, stop, stop to her. They're like, no, no, she gets it. Until one day, they left me alone with Jasmine. And Jasmine showed me why they do that. Because Jasmine was much smarter than I gave her credit for. And she knew how to work me. For real. She knew how to work me. She had gotten in trouble and they told her she, her consequence was she could not have ice cream. So I snuck over there and I said, when they leave, Nana will give you the ice cream. She was like, yeah, got her wrapped around my finger. They left and went on a date and Jasmine wanted to watch TV in the living room and I wasn't feeling well. So we said, we're going to watch it in our bedroom and you can pick whatever movie you want. Jasmine said, no, the big girls watch it out here and I'm a big girl. So I want to watch it out here. I said, Jasmine, I don't feel well. We're going to watch it in there. She said, well, I don't want to watch a movie then. I said, okay, well, if you don't want to watch a movie, you can either watch the movie in here with us or you can get dressed for bed. She said, well, I'll just get dressed for bed then. I said, okay. She went into the bathroom, got her, she put her pull up on. She put her night clothes on. She came out with her little baby and she said, I'm ready for bed. I said, she was two, two and a half. Three. She was three. I'm ready for bed. I said, okay. Go to bed then. And he's over here cracking up. He said, you're getting punked by a three-year-old. He's cracking up. They're smarter than we give them credit for. Now, my son and Amanda, they're in one room. Didi's not feeling good. We got some kind of bug on the trip, right? So Didi's sick. He's vomiting. I'm sick. I'm vomiting. And she goes in there and I put her in there and I'm like, dang, there's no TV or nothing. So I just left the light on and I walked out, left the door open. Our rooms, our rooms here, her room is literally right here. I mean, like if I look out the door, I can see her. She waits till I walk out and she screams at the top of her lung. I mean, screams this like blood curdling. Somebody's hurting me. We're in a condo. There's people upstairs. And I said, did she say? He said, <laughs> she said, mommy, save me. You're getting punked. 
And so he kept watching the movie. I tried to wait it out. And all of a sudden you could count down to it. D'Angelo, sick as a dog, gets up out the bed. Him and Amanda comes over and said, why y'all doing Mohawk like that? That's what they call Jasmine Mohawk. Cause she used to have one little tuft of hair when she was a baby right up top. And they called her Mohawk. He said, why y'all doing Mohawk like that? Y'all don't do her like that. What do they do? Go in there and lay with her until she goes to sleep. I'm texting Kamika and Osi. If y'all make it home and she's screaming, mommy, save me. I swear <laughs> this is what just happened. Kamika said, Nana, meet Jasmine. Jasmine, Nana, we're on a date. Have a good night. <laughs> Jazz punk, me too. I used to love, Mika came over with her one time and you know how they do the more please. I kept sneaking her cracker. <laughs> But the one that I loved the most was the corn one. Wow. She couldn't eat the corn because she, yeah, she couldn't eat it because if she ate it, then the other corns would be lonely. That was classic. I love that one. That one was classic. She used to crack me up as a baby. She, she was, she was so smart. So smart. I cracked happy up. Happy birthday. What was happy birthday over? Was that the corn? When she started singing happy birthday, Kamika. Yes. yes, it was the corn. Yeah, it was the corn. So yeah, she said it would be wrong to eat him on his birthday. <laughs> and and his, the other corns are his friends, so she can't eat him. But this is how smart she was, mm -hmm. or still is, honestly. She's so smart. But these kids are smart. And you got to meet them at that level of intelligence. And one of the things that the Lord has been really dealing with me on, and I'm really starting to study is emotional intelligence because we start to go off. We start to do these things, but we're reacting out of emotion and we're not bringing the intelligence into it. So I'm starting to study it. And that's where this soul under control series is coming from because it's helping me to not just snap off, but the Lord is literally making me think. Okay, well, how did you get here? How did you get to the place where you're so angry that now you done went off on everybody and, and blew up the whole spot? What, what just happened? And I literally, he makes me sit down. I have to go all the way back. And then he asks me another question. Well, why does that really bother you? So I go back through the whole situation that we just had. And he says, why does that really bother you? So then I got to look back even further. And what I do is I find the root to destroy it instead of just dealing with the fruit of what we just went through. So it all ties back to things that I had dealt with in my past or had not really dealt with in my past. And it's not showing the love of God because I'm showing the fruit of whatever this is. And it usually, I'm going to tell you everybody, it's rooted in rejection. Most of the stuff we deal with is rooted in rejection and rejection. That spirit works on you from the time that you are a little, little baby starting around Jersey's age. That's, and some of it is passed through the womb. It can be passed through the womb. So we have to get to the place where we start following. Okay. What really made me mad about that? It's not just, she made me mad. Okay. But why? Start digging in and going under the floorboards to figure out what is it about that that really made you angry and why did it make you angry? Where did this first begin? Where did you encounter this the first time? And then as you start to dig underneath, you're going to find that it ties all the way back to where you were a little kid. And it re whatever this situation is reminds you of this situation all the way back here. And, and it's a trigger for you. The thing about triggers, it's not for everybody else to know what triggers you. It's for you to put a strategy in place so that it no longer triggers you. Amen? Apostle? Yes. I was going to add to it that a lot of times people, we look at the scripture, write the vision, make it plain. It's for a reason because so often we lose sight of the goal in chasing gratification. So a lot of the times we go off and we get angry and we just say what we got to say and we get it off our chest and we do what we got to do just because that's what we feel like. Not understanding that gratification is taking us away, away from the goal. 
So the goal is that you want to be heard, but everything you just came out of your mouth sometimes that we can do, we put stuff out of our mouth that make people shut down. So then we're not heard. So in saying stuff out of our mouth of that gratification, we don't accomplish the goal. Right. So making sure that we are focused on the goal and not the gratification. So sorry, I've been popping in and out during driving. So. <laughs> Yeah. And have you noticed, Anita, that the kids do they argue with one another and fight on a constant basis or they raise their voices at each other? Because you're teaching them that they're mimicking the exact. But they're still watching you because you should be making a difference for them. They're watching you and you're showing them how to handle conflict. And that's exactly what I did with my children and why they're ready to fight just like I was. Now I'm having to reevaluate how I respond, how I react and do it in God's way and not in my way because they're grown, their decisions that they make are theirs, but they're still watching me and how I'm responding, how I'm reacting to the things that they're saying. My husband is still watching me. How can you go teach somebody else when you still need to be taught? Good question. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm trying to figure out. How am I, I'm trying to teach myself plus three kids plus my husband. So when you plus learn, my adult kids. you learn, you regurgitate what you learn and they will get it from that. Do you think my kids love going to church all the time? Absolutely not. <laughs> Because he played all the time. I, and was, I've always been the church boy. I, ask him what he was doing in church, though. Yeah, that part. Yeah, he don't want to answer that part. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, sure he was. Sure he was. And then I started being their teacher, and they really hated that. But they were watching everything that I was doing. And I, that's what makes me feel guilty, because I know they're watching me. And when I finally do snap, I, I'm like... Take 10 to win. That totally just reversed what I'm trying to teach them by acting that way. But if you call on the name of Jesus, he's got to answer. Do you, mom, do you think that it's not helping when you tell me to do stuff or when you help me, like when you showed me that God worked with my brother, I didn't see it, but you showed me. So you're, you're still teaching me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you said that you, you've learned, you learn a lot, but from the level that I'm on, I'm going to say level of coming to God is you're teaching me something that you already know. You're not at my level, I guess. I don't know if I'm mm -hmm. explaining it the right way. So yeah. when you're teaching the kids, you're going to teach them the level that you already know. Right. But I'm also teaching them, like you said, the wrong way. And that's why you keep working on it until you get to the right way. You the keep working way. on it. And how do how do you deal with rejection? Mm -hmm. you but you have to understand. Oh. Here's here's the issue. If we all have a million things that we can find that are not right within, mm -hmm. I have things that I battle. Everybody battles something. Mm -hmm. I don't care who you are. Everybody battles something, and so in that battle, you keep battling until you overtake it. After you overtake it, those things will start to back up off of you and not come at you the same way. Mm -hmm. It'll be something different. But choose one thing to work on. The rest of them, they'll come in time. Amen. Don't overwhelm yourself with all of the things that you can look at that, oh, you don't do this right, you don't do that right. And then you start to condemn yourself. Mm -hmm. So don't make that mistake. You're grown every Amen. day. You are growing. The fact that you sit here and that you just bear it all and you're like, I don't care what y'all think. I need to get this right. And you show up. And, and that's it. The mere fact that you keep showing up tells me a lot. Because most people, they don't show up after they get rebuked once. Mm -hmm. No joke. I ran serious. a lot. So ran and you have gotten rebuked, open rebukes. You're still here. You don't quit. Keep going. You got this. Amen. You're doing better than you think. Certainly. All right. <laughs>
Praise God for the lesson tonight. I pray that everybody got something out of it that they can take and meditate on and regurgitate and help the person that is in the line behind you. Amen. Amen. Do we have any prayer requests online or here? Any prayer requests? Mother, you're on mute. Let me try. Rebellion and rejection. How do okay. you handle that? Pray, pray for, I'm working on this, I'm working on this, running into a wall, feeling like I'm fighting this battle by myself because I keep talking about the same thing over and over and over. The response from the Holy Spirit is, uh, what was it he said? Uh, uh, repent and mm -hmm. not repeat. A righteous man falls seven times, but guess what? He gets back up again. Just keep getting back up. Amen. So we're going to go ahead and pray for that. Um, Mr. Charlie, microphone, please. Rebellion and rejection. And oh, I have a friend that um, she texts me today, that a coworker. And she has some polyps that are on her ovaries and they're testing it to see if it's cancer. And she, um, I asked her if she minded if we put her on the prayer list. Her name is Dina. So if we could continuously pray for Dina, that would be wonderful. Okay, go ahead. Heavenly Father, I wanna thank you for this night that you presented us, all this knowledge that you let us learn tonight. I wanna thank you for letting us do the pantry today, feeding all these people. I just want to thank everybody for the help that they gave us. And I want to thank everybody in here for teaching me a little more about God. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Good night, those that are online. I love you and hope to see you on Sunday. God bless you.